Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation with Michael Burlingame about his book, The Black Man's President, which looks at Abraham Lincoln's personal connections with black people over the course of his career. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up in the next couple of weeks on our YouTube channel. On Tuesday, November 23rd at 1 p.m., H.W. Brands, author of Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution, will describe the American Revolution in a way that shows it to be more than a fight against the British. It was also a violent battle among neighbors forced to choose sides. And on Wednesday, December 1st at 1 p.m., Faye Yarbrough will discuss Choctaw Confederates, her new book about the Choctaw Nation's role in the Civil War. A century and a half of Lincoln scholarship has shown us many facets of this complex man, lawyer, politician, war leader, husband. In Black Man's President, Michael Burlingame invites us to look at Abraham Lincoln through his personal relations with African Americans. He takes his title from a statement by Frederick Douglass six weeks after the president's assassination that Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president, the first to show any respect for the rights of a black man. Lincoln is forever linked to the Emancipation Proclamation, which he issued midway through the Civil War. Although it did not free all those in bondage at the time, the proclamation's promise of freedom changed the character of the war. That landmark document signed by President Lincoln is on display in the National Archives Museum for three days starting today. Also on display today is General Order No. 3 issued on June 19, 1865 by the Commander of Union Troops in Galveston, Texas. Fulfilling the promise of the Emancipation Proclamation, this order announced that 250,000 enslaved persons in Texas were all free. The order became the foundation of Juneteenth the oldest known celebration commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. This is the first time these two milestone documents have been exhibited at the same time. You can also read about the Emancipation Proclamation in General Order No. 3 in an online featured document exhibit at archives.gov. Our guests today are Michael Burlingame and James Oakes. Michael Burlingame holds the Chancellor Naomi B. Lynn Distinguished Chair in Lincoln Studies at the University of Illinois Springfield. He is the author or editor of numerous books about Lincoln, including An American Marriage, Lincoln Observed, The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln, and the two-volume Abraham Lincoln, A Life. James Oakes is professor of humanities at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, an award-winning author. His books include The Crooked Path to Abolition, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, and the Radical and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln. Now let's hear from Michael Burlingame and James Oakes. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, David, for that introduction and welcome everyone to this conversation. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Uh, Michael is a good friend and he's, a, he's a, the premier historian biography, biographer of Abraham Lincoln and he's written a very important book on a very important subject, uh, Lincoln's relationship to African Americans and his views about race and slavery. It's a well-worn topic, but Michael's book represents in some sense the culmination of a trend that began in about 15 years ago or so, when we first began to uncover uh, much more information than we previously had about Lincoln's personal relationships with African Americans, stuff that when I wrote my book on Steve, on Frederick Douglass and Lincoln, I assumed, as did most historians, that Lincoln had few interactions with African-Americans before he got to Washington, D.C. as president. But Michael's book brings to light a, a, a wealth of information about that, and it's a very important book, and I recommend it to everyone who is listening and watching uh, this, this podcast. So let me dive right in. The book is called... Uh, the Black Man's President. Uh, where does that title come from and why is it significant? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jim, for uh, participating in this. And, and uh, thank you, David, uh, for the archives. Uh, second invitation this year to speak on this on this slide. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, and the title of the book comes from a eulogy that Frederick Douglass delivered six weeks after Lincoln was assassinated. 
It was delivered in Cooper Union in New York, obviously the most prominent spot in the country to give a public utterance in those days. It was covered extensively by New York newspapers um, and amazingly has escaped to the attention of historians and anthologists. You look through all the, the collections of five fat volumes of uh, Frederick Douglass speeches that Yale published, the speech isn't there. Uh, you look in the four volume edition that uh, um, Philip Foner uh, put together, that's not there. Uh, and, and it's just astounding to me. And when I was doing research on the Frederick Douglass papers, this was some time ago, I was astounded to come across this eulogy because he starts off by saying that Abraham Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president, the first to rise above the prejudice of his time and his country by inviting me, Frederick Douglass, to consult with him on public affairs at the White House. He was saying by that gesture, I am the president of the black people as well as the white people, and I mean to honor their rights as men and citizens. And so I was sitting in the Library of Congress and, and came across this speech in Frederick Douglass's handwriting, and I was just flabbergasted because I, like almost everybody who's paid any attention to the question of Lincoln and race, uh, was intimately familiar with the 1876 speech right. that almost everybody knows who pays any attention to this sort of thing. Uh, in which he said that Abraham Lincoln was preeminently the white man's president. And we black people were only his stepchildren. And I was just astounded. Um, and so uh, I, I, uh, I tried to get in touch with the people at Yale and say, uh, er, why was this omitted? And no response. Um, well, those of us who went to Princeton aren't surprised that Yale would conduct itself in this fashion, but what can I tell you in any event? Um, and so I thought, well, this, this needs to be more widely known. And then when your book came out, uh, on Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, the, the radical and the Republican. Uh, it, it gave some uh, um, publicity or, or called readers' attention to this very important document. Um, and um, so uh, uh, I, I then uh, tried to explain or come to terms with uh, why was it that Lincoln would say, um, uh, Frederick Douglass would say that Lincoln was uh, emphatically the black man's president in 1870 and 65, and then the opposite in 1876. Um, and so I devote a chapter of my book to this question. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm acting on a cue that uh, is contained in the excellent biography of Frederick Douglass that was published recently, uh, written by David Blight of Yale, uh, in which he said, you, you must understand that when Lincoln is mentioned by Frederick Douglass, when he, when he uh, expounds on, on Lincoln, it's, it's in the context of a specific political moment. And it has that context, uh, that significance. Uh, and in 1876, what Frederick Douglass was concerned about foremost, like any reasonable person at that time who cared about racial justice, uh, is that Reconstruction, uh, which had gotten really a, a boost from Lincoln uh, and during the war in 1863, when he puts forward a Reconstruction plan, and then a big boost on April 11th, 1865, two days after Robert E. Lee surrender, uh, surrendered, uh, virtually ending the war. Uh, and Lincoln calls for black voting rights for the first time. Uh, and so he sets in motion the reconstruction, which led to the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment and uh, the 13th Amendment, of course. Um, and, uh, uh, and Lincoln gets murdered for that, by the way. Um, Lincoln was not murdered because he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves in the Confederate States. He was not murdered because he supported the... Uh, 13th Amendment abolishing slavery throughout the nation and in the border states as well and the occupied regions as well. He was murdered because he called for black voting rights. Uh, and therefore, I think it's appropriate for us in the 21st century to regard Lincoln as a martyr to black civil rights, voting rights, citizenship rights, as much as Martin Luther King or Medgar Evers or any of those people who were murdered back in the 1960s as they championed the civil rights revolution of that period. So in any event, um, so in 1876, Reconstruction is going down the tubes. Congress and the, the public has supported a remarkable set of laws and, and amendments uh, to establish first-class citizenship for black people. Uh, and for a little while, those uh, statutes and amendments were vigorously and rigorously enforced. But by the mid 1870s, public attention had waned, a depression had occurred, people were concerned more about unemployment and, and uh, financial uh, matters and the like. And, um, and so, so the, the question of racial justice in the South got uh, put onto the back burner. And so, and so what Frederick Douglass was doing that day in 1876 was addressing the power elite of the country. 
it was the occasion was the dedication of the of a famous statue now very controversial but um uh, and a large black population was there but also this is in washington dc uh, it's the emancipation memorial is the, the, the official term um and uh Inclu uh, included in the audience was the president, uh, members of the cabinet, leaders of Congress, justices Supreme of the Court. Supreme Court, so the, the power elite. And so Lincoln, uh, I mean, Frederick Douglass was really addressing them saying, look, Abraham Lincoln was not some kind of bleeding heart sentimentalist. He was a tough minded fellow who understood that um, the interests of the white race, which he really cared about most, would be promoted by having black people enjoy first class citizenship. Uh, so don't re don't let Reconstruction go. Don't let what he started, not out of a bleeding heart sentimentality, but out of a practical, hard nosed understanding of what was good for white folks, um, was black folks having first class citizenship. So I, I and so so that that speech of 1876, which is widely known, is really an outlier compared to what uh, the the eulogy of 65, and then almost every statement that Frederick Douglass makes about Lincoln after 1876. And so it has to be understood in that context. And so, uh, and, also, and one of the things he says in that 1876 speech is that Lincoln had the prejudices of his time and his country, but he would said just the opposite. And what my book attempts, attempts to show is that he really didn't <laughs> have those prejudices. And that is manifested um, in a way uh, that has not been explored uh, in sufficient depth, I think. And that is how Lincoln interacted face to face with black people in Springfield, and in Washington, if you look at that record, which I go into in some detail, it shows that, that he really was a kind of an instinctive racial egalitarian. Why don't, why don't we do that then? Why don't we start? Because some of the most uh, uh, important information that's new in your book is the material you have on Lincoln's relationship with African-Americans in Springfield, even before he got to Springfield, but, but it sets the stage for much of the rest of the book. So. Why don't you talk like William Johnson we knew about, but, but it's much more extensive than that. Right, right. Uh, now, uh, I don't pretend to be the pioneer in this in this particular aspect of the story. There is a very fine historian attorney in Springfield uh, named Richard Hart, and, and uh, he's a good friend. And, and Dick has been doing research on, on black people in Springfield in the Lincoln era for a long time. And he is an indefatigable researcher um, and has uncovered all kinds of really valuable information, but painstakingly garnered from court records and uh, uh, graveyards uh, records and all kinds of places. Um, and he's shown that Lincoln interacted with black people a lot in Springfield and that the uh, People with whom he interacted, insofar as we know what they felt, um, because these were people who didn't leave autobiographies or diaries or letter collections, um, was very positive that Lincoln treated them with kindness and respect and, and uh, dignity. Um, and, uh, and, and it wasn't just the people who worked in the house. There were black servants who, who said this. Um, but they were they were uh, they were actual friends and 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 sometimes legal clients um, and and the most telling piece of evidence about the nature of his interaction with black people in Springfield uh, is the story of his relationship with his barber uh, William Florville, sometimes called Florville. And during the war in 1863, Lincoln receives a long letter from William Florville, this black gentleman. Uh, which is clearly not the letter of a client to a patron or a, uh, a, an, an attorney right. and his, his, his uh, client, uh, but a real friend. Because he, as he talks about how, how much he had admired Lincoln's uh, son, Willie, um, and had he sang his praises and said he seemed much more mature than any boy that he knew of that age. And, and Willie had died at the age of 11 in the White House. And Lincoln was deeply distraught. And so this is a letter of condolence. Um, and the feeling tone of that letter, particularly when he talks about Willie, is clearly somebody who's, who's personally connected to, to Lincoln as, as a friend and not just as a, as a customer or a client. And then he goes on to talk about how, um, how Will, uh, the, the boy's dog, the Lincoln boy's dog, Fido, is being well cared for. And even the house that's been sublet uh, by the Lincolns yes. is being well cared for by the people who live there because, in part, because they don't have any children to ruin things, <laughs> as, right. as he puts it in that right. letter. And, and then he goes on to talk in, in ways about his wishing him well and, and be expressing gratitude for all he's done for the Black race. Um, 
it, it's clearly a, a, a man talking to another, a friend talking to another friend. And it's, so it, this, it, this it, I think, is, is indicative of the kind of relationship he had yes. with people in Springfield. And it just just for people who are listening, if, they, if they're interested, that letter, it's, it is quite a remarkable letter. That letter has just been published in a, in a very important collection of letters written to Abraham Lincoln from African-Americans. It's the opening letter in a book uh, published by Jonathan White, another fine Lincoln scholar. Indeed, Jonathan interested. White's book is very important. If if you are interested in looking at that letter, look up that book. I can't remember the title of the book, but collection of, of letters. Um, Me either, but the absent might a pair of absent minded professors. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you talk a little bit about the the uh, his his relationship to African Americans who were his clients? Because uh, everybody's talked about the Matson case for many years, but there's a lot more to that to his story of his relationship to Blacks as a lawyer. Well, I, right. And one of the things that I discovered it was actually, I was, I was called to my attention to, uh, to my attention by another very fine historian who's been doing work on Black people in Illinois for a long time, Roger Bridges. Uh, Roger uh, recently yes. sent me a, an obituary of a woman who died in the 1890s. Uh, and in the course of this, this obituary, all the details of which check out, except there's this one area which uh, is, is hard to, to uh, nail down, but it's insofar as the rest of the obituary is all uh, above board and accurate, um, this, it seemed plausible. According to this obituary, this woman as a teenager was a servant in Vandalia, Illinois, which at the time was the state capital. And uh, the, the, this woman's mother worked in this boarding house uh, where Lincoln may well have stayed. And we're not sure exactly that he stayed there, but it seems plausible. In any event, according to this obituary, uh, the, the, this uh, dead woman's mother uh, was an indentured servant slash slave in Illinois. There was a somewhat big <laughs> boundary between those two categories yes. at that time. And uh, she... Uh, and she was to be uh, indentured uh, and in effect a slave until the age of 18. But the Lincoln got her out of her indentures beforehand. Yes. And I'd never seen anything to this effect. Um, and then um, I, I went through the papers insofar as I could find them with Fayette County, Illinois, um, and for the 1830s, which are very spotty. And I didn't find the, the free paper, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, and um, and I, what I did find with doing a little research was that at that time, uh, the Illinois State Supreme Court had just ruled that uh, black people who were indentured before 1818, that is when Illinois entered the union, became a state, um, had, to, had to honor their indentures. Uh, they were bound by them. But any children born of folks who uh, were indentured after 1818 uh, could not be held to those indentures. Right. And, so, and, and that's right in 1836, and it, would, it fits the time scheme. And it seems plausible to me that Lincoln, as a, as a fledgling lawyer, he'd just been admitted to the bar, would know about this. And the Supreme Court met in Vandalia, a small town, so he's bound to know about it, that he probably told this young woman that, you know, you're really not, <laughs> you don't have to be, you're not uh, I honor these indentures um, and, you're free, and you're free. And so, so he may have freed, that may have been the first person, he, first black person he freed in 1836. Um, right. Well, it makes sense. It fits into a larger pattern of, of freedom suits that took place under the auspices of the Northwest Ordinance and, and the like. So it, it made perfect sense to me when I read your story of it. I had never heard that story. Well, this, this, this was new, and I'm very grateful to Roger for having called it to my attention. Roger called the, the crocodile speech to my attention, too, by the way. He's... Uh, oh, right. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that later. So... Uh, Despite the paucity of written documentation about uh, uh, Lincoln's interactions with African Americans in Springfield, the sense that he was a kind and uh, and perfectly non prejudicial friend of so many African Americans in Springfield seems to be reinforced by what you talk about uh, and Lincoln's relationship with the staff at the White House when he gets to Washington D.C. So, can right. we talk a little bit about that? There we do sure. have more documentation, and it confirms your analysis, it seems to me, of his, right. of, of his um, prior uh, history in Springfield. Right. Well, and, and th there's an overlap of those two categories uh, of, of Springfield Blacks and then the White House yes. staff. 
because uh, Lincoln brought with him from Springfield to Washington, a, a black servant, a body servant, a valet in fact, um, uh, named William H. Johnson, uh, a young man in his twenties. Uh, um, and uh, Lincoln uh, wanted to put him on the White House staff uh, and, and did so, uh, but there was a kind of revolt by the black people who were on the staff. The, the staff consisted of a lot more people than just black people, but uh, the black people were all light-skinned and William H. Johnson was dark-skinned. And there was strong prejudice against dark-skinned blacks by light-skinned blacks, which goes way back to the house slaves versus the field hands that Frederick Douglass so eloquently describes in his autobiography. Um, and so Lincoln bent over backwards to get him some, well, first of all, just put him in the basement to tend the furnace while he tried to find him. <laughs> so he, he wouldn't offend the, the light-skinned blacks on the staff. And so he went to, to the uh, Navy Department, tried to get him a job, that didn't work out. And finally, the, the Treasury Department, which was headed up by the most uh, radical anti-slavery member of the cabinet, right. uh, got him a job in the Treasury Department, which was right next door to the White House. So evidently he worked in the mornings with Lincoln, helped shave him and get him ready for the day. And then we'd go over to act as a messenger in the library at the, at the, at the Treasury Department. Um, but then we, we know a lot about Lincoln's interaction with the black staff members because a, 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 an amateur historian named Johnny Washington uh, uh, in the uh, 1930s uh, interviewed a lot of people who either knew Lincoln that has served in the Lincoln White House or whose parents or other relatives served. Mm -hmm. And this very important book called They Knew Lincoln appeared. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the people who were interviewed recall Lincoln's uh, kindness and generosity and lack of prejudice and, and respect uh, uniformly. Um, and it wasn't just it wasn't just the interactions and the White House would and Lincoln never would give an order. He would he would request people to do this, that or the other thing. Um, but in addition, one of the seamstresses who worked at the White House uh, recalls that when Lincoln went to the summer White House uh, in, 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 in the warm months in Washington in 62, 63 uh, and 64, the Lincoln family spent the warmer months in, a, in what was known as the soldier's home, still is. Um, and it's about three miles north of the White House. It's, it's elevated. So if there were any breeze blowing or any place to escape the oppressive heat and humidity of Washington, which I grew up in, um, uh, it was, was most welcome. Um, and so, uh, and that, that on occasion he would pass by uh, what was known as a contraband camp, which was a place where uh, refugee slaves uh, were uh, congregated um, and, and Lincoln would, would uh, uh, greet the people there and, and that they would be involved in a, a hymn sing and he would join in singing the hymns. Um, and, uh, and, and the, this uh, seamstress Rosetta Wells says it, when he was there, he was not the president. He was just another member of the gang <laughs> singing songs and, and tears would come to his eyes. Uh, and, and then that when, when, uh, when the old people uh, were particularly uh, jubilant, uh, Lincoln would, would, would not ridicule them or, or like he would, he would join with them. And, and so he showed a kind of instinctive um, egalitarianism, which, uh, which reflected what, what we had seen yeah, in right. Springfield, right? And so, uh, uh, which brings us to the more famous interactions with prominent African-Americans who visited with Lincoln in the White House. This was, uh, although there had been a couple of occasions uh, in which African-Americans had come to the White House, they, they pale beside the numbers and significance of the, of the, uh, the African-Americans that, that Lincoln himself greeted in the White House and discussed, as you mentioned, Frederick Douglass said, issues of, uh, you know, national- Wait, and, and so it's well, not just one. It's, it's a lot of them. Right. 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 Yes. Um, and uh, one of the one of the more interesting and one of the, one of the first ones that's actually recorded. Uh, now, in 1861, we don't have a record of, of black visitors coming to the White House, but we do have Lincoln's interaction with the staff. Now, 1862, black people start to come and, and appeal to him. And one of the first uh, is a very prominent. Um, uh, a black leader who uh, urges Lincoln, uh, this was a, a Bishop Daniel Payne uh, of the African um, American uh, Episcopal Church, the AME Church. Um, and uh, 
he, he, he urges Lincoln to sign the bill to emancipate slaves in, in the District of Columbia. The Congress had passed the bill, it had sat on the president's desk for a couple of days, and there was some anxiety uh, among blacks about whether or not Lincoln would actually sign the bill, although he, he, he himself had written a bill to abolish slavery when he was a member of Congress back in 1849. And in any event, so uh, he asked him um, uh, to please sign the bill. Um, and, and Lincoln, um, Lincoln treats him very cordially um, and, and expresses his, his, his sympathy with, with the effort. Um, it doesn't contain every feature of the bill that he would like to see, um, uh, but then he does sign it um, that day or, or the day thereafter. Um, and that leads to something very interesting. And that is a, a newspaper account written by a British journalist stationed in Washington for a newspaper in London, the London Star. And, and, he, and so he describes this piece of legislation, which was, which was the, the first step, the, the first action by the federal government to abolish slavery. All, all the slaves in the District of Columbia are, are to, be uh, to be freed. Um, uh, but, and, and this gentleman, this, this uh, newspaper correspondent, a guy named Frederick Milnes Edge, uh, describes this bill in some detail. And then says, look, there's, there's one feature in it which Europeans are going to find hard to understand. And that is that Congress has appropriated uh, 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 $100,000, which in modern terms would be say three or 4 million um, to, um, to promote colonization. Uh, and, and, and Europeans are bound to be somewhat puzzled by this. And so he says, and I, if, if I may just briefly uh, quote, he says, um, um, it is likely to meet with misconstruction in Europe that is namely the appropriation for colonizing the freed slaves. And then he goes on to say, this was adopted to silence the weak nerved whose name is Legion. Uh, that's number one is, is to have an effect on the public opinion. That is the people who are fearful that uh, emancipation is gonna lead to a tsunami of black people flooding the North and all kinds of uh, disruption. That's number one. And number two, uh, to enable any of the slaves who see fit to migrate uh, to more congenial climes, not, not to force all the black people out of the country, um, but to make it possible for people who, as you put it so eloquently in your book, uh, are, are, are black pessimists who understandably fear that they never are going to achieve first class citizenship in the United States, that, that anti-black sentiment was so widespread and so deep seated that, that reasonable black people uh, would despair of ever having a fair shot at, at first life citizenship, and so, so, and th and and this I think is is accurate. That those those two things are the things that make Lincoln a publicly yes. espouse uh, colonization, not the notion that he's he's going to have all the black people in the country uh, deported, um, uh, but that that. Um, racial pessimists uh, deserve some some that the government owes them some kind of chance to get a first class citizenship in another country. And the government has a responsibility to help facilitate that. Well, in a way, um, that last interview you discussed with with uh, uh, Bishop Bain. No, the last one in January of 1865 with the uh, father of black nationalism. I'm, I'm skipping Delaney, Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney. Yeah. Delaney you know, so he says something very similar. You know, we need, we need to get more blacks down into the South, black soldiers, and they should be commanded by blacks. We can't put them in, we can't put black officers in charge of whites because we all know that the overwhelming number of whites will not accept and tolerate that. So this is widely known. And, and Lincoln right. makes a very exactly. similar argument. So, so that brings us to the very famous meeting. Why don't we discuss this with uh, the African-American delegation in Washington, D.C. about colonization, because the, the context you've established of Lincoln's graciousness and friendliness and openness and lack of prejudice, which all African-Americans who met him commented on, seems so different from this particular meeting and, and helped put that in context. And you do a better job than anyone I've seen of establishing the context in which that meeting takes place. So why don't you tell us about what that meeting was and the context in which it took place? Oh, well, thank you, Jim. Um, the, uh, the meeting took place on August 14th, 1862, uh, and Lincoln summoned to the White House five black leaders, or, or he sent out a message to the black churches um, a, a few days earlier 
saying that the president has been uh, granted, recently granted, a lot of money to promote colonization. Back in April, the Congress had appropriated 100,000, and that dealt just with Washington blacks. Now in July, 500,000, which deals with black people in general. Um, and so he has $600,000, and they need 30, 40 million, so in modern currency. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he, he wants to know how to spend it. Uh, and uh, so that's the official, that, that's the message that goes out to the black uh, clergymen who then uh, share that with their audiences. And then five gentlemen step forward and leaders of black society. This, these are people of, of some stature, uh, they're educated uh, people of, of um, real social respect among the black community in Washington and, and the white community too, for that matter. And so, um, so he calls them into the office uh, ostensibly to discuss, but in fact, to listen to a lecture. <laughs> Yes, and and so Lincoln <laughs> Lincoln delivers them a lecture about colonization, um, and the tone, as you suggest, Jim, the tone is a little condescending, uh, uh, and uh, is very different in texture and feeling from all the descriptions we have prior to that August fourteenth, eighteen sixty two meeting, and the, all the meetings subsequent to that right. August fourteenth, eighteen sixty two meeting. And so what accounts for that? Well, uh, I, I think the, the, the main thing that's on Lincoln's mind at that point is, is what uh, the, the British journalist, uh, Frederick Milnes Edge said, uh, Lincoln was worried about the weak nerved whose number was legion, um, um, that is particularly people who uh, would uh, grudgingly accept emancipation, but only if they were assured that their states would not be overrun by freed slaves fleeing uh, to the to the north, and he's and he is at that moment he is sitting on a draft of exactly. the Emancipation Proclamation. Exactly, he has he, he, he knows has it's going to come. Right, a, a month earlier, he had told his cabinet right. that he was going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. He said, I, I, "I'm not asking your opinion. Um, I'm going to do it, but, but I, I want you to know this." And and then he's told. The, by Seward and others that, uh, look, uh, we've just suffered a humiliating defeat um, in our attempt to capture Richmond. Uh, if we issue an Emancipation Proclamation on the heels of that uh, disgraceful defeat, it will look insincere and we, we count for nothing. Let's wait till we have a military victory. So Lincoln takes the Emancipation Proclamation and puts it in his desk drawer and is waiting for uh, an opportunity to, to issue it on the heels of a Union victory. Uh, in the meantime, he realizes, and he's been told by lots of people, that, look, if you don't couple emancipation with colonization, it's not going to sit well with our constituents, members of the Senate, members of the House, old friends from Kentucky. We're all telling this. You've got to couple emancipation with colonization because of this, this, this significant fear, groundless though it might be, of, of, of a black tsunami coming northward. Um, and so, so Lincoln then invites these people in and urges them to be uh, pioneers in a, uh, in a colonization effort in what we now call Panama. Uh, and, and he starts off by saying, uh, we are of different races and your race suffers and our, my, our race suffers and therefore we really shouldn't be uh, together. Um, uh, and uh, you, there are already attempts to establish uh, places of refuge in Africa like Liberia, but that's pretty far away. And, and uh, a lot of you, I understand, would like to stay in the same hemisphere with your enslaved friends and relatives and do something to help free them. Um, uh, also, it's also Lincoln's clearest expression of racial pessimism, right? Because, you know, every, right. he, there's he, no he, place you can go he, in this country. Go to the place you're right. treated best right. and you're still not treated equally. Right. You don't, you know. That's right. Right. And that and that is true. Uh, just that it's almost the almost the day that this account of Lincoln's interaction with these five black leaders appears, John Rock, uh, a Boston attorney, who then becomes the first black person to be admitted to the Supreme Court bar to argue cases before the High Court, um, says, "Look, even in Boston, we're treated like second-class citizens, and and uh, uh, and if Boston and, and if Boston is in the vanguard." Um, and so, so Lincoln was was uh, was just telling a hard truth. Um, he didn't approve of it. Um, he, he, and actually, he he says, "You and I both 
both deplore this. We both think alike. And he says, that's right. pretty strong language. Even um, back at, even uh, back at Peoria, right? He said, right. whether right. this feeling accords with justice is irrelevant. If the vast majority of us feel this way, we have to deal with it. Right. And and time and again, when Lincoln makes statements that sound to our, our ears reactionary and hidebound and, and retrogressive, um, he qualifies it in a way so that you can interpret it. If, whether this is right or wrong, we won't, needn't discuss, but that means it could well be wrong to, to judge black people in this fashion. Um, but that's 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 for another was. another uh, topic subtopic. But but this this larger point is that he wanted the, the and 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 a striking feature of this meeting is that he invites a shorthand reporter to come in to take his words verbatim. It's the only time he does that. That's right. Um, unfortunately, from a biographer's point of view, you wish somebody had been doing that for every meeting that he had. Oh, I um, see. Or, right. 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 Just that um, one. <laughs> right. But it's, so, it's an indication that it's, a, it's to some extent a performance for the wider public. Exactly. And it's really his, his audience, and to his mind, is not these five gentlemen so much as it is all the newspaper readers who will get to hear or read his words as they're being transcribed verbatim by this reporter for, for a local uh, newspaper, uh, anti-slavery newspaper, uh, pro-administration newspaper. Um, so, so Lincoln is trying to grease the skids for emancipation. Um, that doesn't mean that he was insincere, uh, uh, but it does mean that he didn't, he didn't envision uh, ethnic cleansing, getting rid of all black people, but he did envision that, that it, would, it, it would increase the chances that emancipation would be accepted by, by skeptics and, and conservatives. And also that there are black pessimists and they do deserve some kind of government support in attempting to find a place overseas where they can be treated like first class citizens. Um, right. And, right. And, and so, and, and at the end, um, how do we know this is the case? Well, one of the striking things I found in my research for this particular book was, was an account in, in a black newspaper uh, by, uh, by a prominent leader of the black community in Washington, Henry McNeil Turner, becomes pretty famous after the war. Um, and uh, in his journalism, uh, his account of this meeting, uh, Henry McNeil Turner uh, says, uh, let's not get too excited. Um, there's some fear that Lincoln is trying to deport all the black oh, yes. folks. That's not true. He, he's he loves liberty just as much as anybody, and he knows that it's a it's a physical impossibility to get rid of all of four million blacks in America. It's preposterous. Um, but what Lincoln was doing um, was to create, um, and this, if I may, again, just use some of his own words. Uh, Mr. Lincoln is not half such a stickler for colored expatriation, interesting term, as has been uh, pronounced. Um, his his meeting with the five. Uh, Black leaders was a strategic move upon his part in contemplation of the Emancipation Proclamation just delivered. This is just slightly after the Emancipation Proclamation was announced publicly on September 22nd. Uh, it was the preparatory nucleus around which he intended to cluster the reign of objections uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation went forth. Now that's a somewhat clouded image, but I think the, it's a kind of shield to protect the Emancipation Proclamation from this reign of objections. Um, and then he goes on to say the president needed a point, uh, a place to point to where blacks could go. And so he, in that meeting with the five black leaders, he talks about Panama and the, the very specific about how this, this, this one region would be really a suitable spot for people who wanted to emigrate in order to achieve first class citizenship. And then, and then a lot of black leaders go berserk, including Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass really lashes out at Lincoln. He calls him, a, this is an example of Lincoln's race hatred and, and white supremacy. And uh, it's just terrible, really harsh language. And one of the ironies is Frederick Douglass had three adult sons. Two of them volunteered to go to Panama as part of this project. So if Lincoln was a hopeless racist putting forward a hopeless racist project, what are, what are Frederick Douglass's adult sons doing signing up for it? And, and according to the guy who was in charge, 14,000 black, 14,000 volunteered to go to the, on, on this. Now it, it all fizz, fizzled because of the, of the objection of some of the Central American nations and also some uh, uh, shaky- I mean, The contracts uh, contract uh, contract were pretty shady. This, it was a shady right. deal. So right. Lincoln right. Had, to, had to throw the contracts in the trash. But, right. um, but the larger point I think is, is once you understand 
uh, uh, the strategic point of that meeting and it took place and his and his tone and notice because of all we now know about the very different tone he took with African Americans in every other venue that we've seen you can it it stands out it it is not a representative of the way Lincoln uh, 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 interaction with African Americans it's the exception that proves the rule correct. It's very much an outlier, yes. Very much uh -huh. an outlier. And that raises the, the question, the large, one of the larger questions uh, that your book raises, and that is, we've known for decades, historians who have about Lincoln's statements about race and some of the unfortunate ones, some of the terrible ones, but also many of the more enlightened ones. And there are many enlightened statements about race in the Lincoln corpus, right? But what does this new information we have about Lincoln's uh, very gracious and friendly and unprejudiced personal interactions with so many African-Americans do to help us maybe go back and look at those very familiar statements? Uh, does it change the way we should think about them? Does it help us understand them? What do you think? Well, I think that the, uh, as, as you point out, the, the statements that are trotted out regularly to prove that Lincoln was a hopeless racist are, are uh, widely known, but they're not put in context. And, and most of them come from the 1858 uh, debate with Stephen A. Douglas, the debates in, in which Lincoln, uh, as you point out in your book, uh, Lincoln was trying to get to, to, to just sideline, to put uh, to the side the whole question of black citizenship rights. And because put yourself in Lincoln's shoes. If Lincoln believes that there, uh, let, let's say we hypothesize, Lincoln believes that there are two evils. One is slavery, four million people enslaved. Uh, and he says, this is the, 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 your people suffer the worst in prejudice and oppression of any people ever. And that's what he says to the five black gentlemen. Um, and then and then he also says to them that, that go where you will, you're still under the ban. And, and, and you and I both feel that's terrible. So now, now in 1858, Lincoln says, okay, um, uh, are we going to attack slavery or black discrimination, second class citizenship in the North? Now, there are 250,000 or so free blacks in the North who can't vote and can't hold office and can't intermarry with whites or serve on juries. There are four million black people in the South who are suffering this most egregious oppression. And so if now, ideally, you'd be able to campaign against both of those evils simultaneously. And you could if you were in New Hampshire or Massachusetts or Vermont. But not if you're in central Illinois, which arguably, or Illinois, which is arguably, and eh, it's pretty clear, the most negrophobic state in the union. Um, well, and, yeah. and, and so, so um, if, if you come out and you say, I believe black people should be voters and jurors and allowed to serve and <laughs> intermarry with whites, you, Stephen A. Douglas is going to trounce you. And if Stephen A. Douglas wins this election, he probably goes on to become president. And he will, he will then... Uh, 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 forward the, uh, as Frederick Douglass said, the Stephen A. Douglas was, was the most dangerous um, uh, uh, person in the country when it came to preserving and protecting uh, uh, slavery. Um, and Douglas said, well, I don't care whether slavery is voted up or voted down, but he was trying to convince the public, don't care about slavery, don't care about the morality of slavery, view it as a local option question, whether, whether there should be cranberry laws or whether there should be local option on liquor or that sort of thing. And Lincoln says, once he does that, slavery will be expanded by the Supreme Court to every state in the Union. If the United States will be entirely a slave, a slave nation. So in Lincoln's mind, the defeat of Stephen A. Douglas was a very high priority, not just for his own personal ambition, although he was free to uh, freely admitted that he was an ambitious man, but that the, the stakes involved were so high that, that he couldn't afford to let Douglas win by default by failing to respond to Douglas's shameless race bidding. Uh, we won't go into it here, but take our word for it. The he just was just flagrant, it's awful. The N word just appears all the time. And just the, the government was formed by white men for white men and, and didn't include the Declaration of Independence. This did not include Negroes or, or the Fiji Islands or Malays or Coolies. I mean, he was a really flagrant racist. And so, so Lincoln had to respond. Right. So tell me, tell me what you think of this, because I've, I've thought this for a while. I don't know if I can prove it or not. But I think Lincoln was scarred, not scarred, shocked by the level of racist demagoguery in that 1858 campaign. Because after it, after it, starting in 1858, 
he starts denouncing not only slavery, but racism. He starts saying he, the danger, the danger that Douglas's, Stephen Douglas's racist demagoguery represents is that it will condition Northerners to the belief that slavery is okay, right? And right. he starts right. explicitly attacking the racist, that kind of racist demagoguery, you know, uh, right. more and more openly, more openly than he ever had. And culminating, I think, in that New Haven speech where it's just a frontal assault on that kind of racial demagoguery. Did you get, do you ever get that impression that, that there was something about that campaign that tripped Lincoln into that kind of, that way of, of thinking about things, his well, willingness uh, to be more open? Yes, I think it, it intensified, it intensified his understanding of the depth and breadth of anti-Black sentiment. Um, and, and he was he was appalled by it. And he starts off by, uh, by saying in the 1858 campaign, uh, the, he starts officially with a House Divided speech, but then a month later, he and Douglas both give speeches in Chicago, and Douglas engages in the most flagrant race baiting. And, and Lincoln, the next day, concludes his very eloquent remarks oh, yes. by saying, let's set aside all this quibbling about this race and being superior and that race being inferior and the inferior race must be placed in an inferior position. And let's all unite once again behind this as a, as a country, behind the great old Declaration of Independence and declare that all men are created equal. And then Douglas hammers him with that, yeah. hammers him, and hammers him, and hammers him. And so Lincoln feels obliged to pay lip service anyway to the to the dominant uh, uh, negrophobia of Illinois, because that's the you have to make that minimum gesture in order to to right. Uh, right. Uh, to have any chance of defeating Stephen A. Douglas. Um, and, so, and so to yeah. So how does this? Uh, you have a, a chapter in your book called 1864 Annis Mirabilis, right? Uh, in which you you just go through the extraordinary series of, of what's what do we call them anti-racist things that happen thanks to Lincoln and the Republicans in 1864. Why don't you go through some? Because because ultimately ultimately it seems to me this is the significance of what you are finding and what you are talking about. Right. That so is, so that the, it leads to genuine policy changes. You know, right. Okay. And, and that's another thing that needs to be underscored. Uh, in, in 1864, one of the most dramatic episodes of Lincoln interacting with black people occurs in March when two gentlemen from New Orleans come bearing a petition signed by a thousand residents of that city um, saying, look, we're property owners, we're educated, we're literate, we're, we're, and we would like to vote. Oh, yes. Um, and, and Lincoln says, uh, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, but you should realize that under our constitution, voter eligibility is determined by states and not by the federal government. That, of course, gets changed by the post-war amendments. Um, uh, and uh, sympathetic as I am, uh, I, 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 I urge I would urge the local the, the state government to deal with that. And then a few days later, he writes a letter to the governor of Illinois, the newly uh, Louisiana, the newly elected uh, governor of Louisiana as, as a free state congratulating him on his victory and saying that he believes that uh, at the, the new constitutional convention, which will be, which is about to be held, that, uh, that it should enfranchise some black people, at least uh, the kind of people whose signatures appeared on this petition, that is the educated and also um, veterans of the war. They didn't have to be educated or liter illiterate, but if you served in the army, um, you should be uh, allowed to vote. And uh, if you're educated, that is to say literate, you should be allowed to vote too. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then that, that of course doesn't happen. What, what happens is the, the Constitutional Convention in New Louisiana meets and the first thing they do is say, the legislature of this state shall never be authorized to <laughs> enfranchise black people. Well, thanks to Lincoln's letter and some lobbying on behalf of, of Lincoln's point, uh, they turn about and say, if the legislature in its wisdom decides to enfranchise black people, that's fine, they can do that. Um, and then Lincoln makes that point publicly for the first time uh, and gets murdered, as I mentioned earlier, um, for ca calling for black voting rights. Um, uh, but then in 1865, you get, you get again and again and again, examples of how much progress there's been made toward racial equality and racial justice during the course of the war, during the course of Lincoln's administration. For example, on, on uh, the, uh, New Year's Day, the, the New Year's reception at the White House, lots and lots of black people show up and they're admitted. 
um, and uh, uh, treated respectfully. That, that had actually started uh, back in 64, but, but in 65, you get a large number coming to the White House. Um, uh, on March 4th, on Lincoln's uh, second inauguration day, um, uh, large numbers of black people turn out. And, are very, uh, and uh, to the amazement of, of journalists, it was, it was just astounding to see this many black people involved in public uh, ceremonies. <clears throat> Um, black soldiers participate for the first time in uh, an inaugural parade. Black musicians participate for the first time in an inaugural parade. Um, uh, a black person, as John Rock, whom I mentioned earlier, be becomes the first black person to uh, argue a case before the United States Supreme Court. Henry Highland Garnett, uh, a black uh, 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 preacher and, and uh, leading black abolitionist in New York, um, uh, delivers a, uh, a speech in uh, uh, a, a sermon in, in the House of Representatives. Um, uh, and so uh, all kinds of, of uh, milestones are uh, reached in, in at the beginning of 1865. And well, then when Martin, Delaney is, is, Martin Delaney is, is given a commission. Well, right, right. Martin Delaney is appointed. Right, Martin Delaney, who's, who's the father of black nationalism, as, as modern historians have, have dubbed him, uh, comes in and is, is very impressed by Lincoln's openness to his, to his suggestion that an all black army with black officers, because uh, under the regular Union Army, you couldn't have black officers, but, uh, and that they should then go and spread the word that emancipation is, is following in our wake, that the president has made this war a war, not only for the preservation of the union, but also for the elimination of slavery. Um, and, and Delaney himself is, and, 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 and he is commissioned, right? He, is, he gets a commission as an right, officer. He's commissioned as a major, as, 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 as the highest ranking line officer, that is one who is at a, really in charge of troops. And he goes off to South Carolina to raise uh, troops for that mission, but then along comes Along comes uh, the end of the war, and so that it's it's scrapped. So, well, also, yeah, go ahead. So uh, uh, I hadn't thought about this until I read your book. We've known uh, about these very prominent African Americans who come to the White House and discuss public affairs with Lincoln, but there is another different kind of color line about these uh, uh, these these inauguration. Balls, these inauguration, these these various uh, uh, non-official kind of events that that uh, uh, that African Americans begin to show up at and break a different kind of color line. That is, they're not coming to the White House to discuss public affairs with Lincoln. They're coming to, uh, 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 as you said, uh, the January first New Year's inaugural. You know. Uh, New Year's annual New Year's bash at the White House, and they're showing up, especially in significant numbers. So, so that too, uh, I, I hadn't thought too much about that, uh, but it was controversial, right? Uh, the, uh, right. Oh, exactly. It's, uh, and of every, right. Every time Lincoln treats a, a black visitor to the White House, and then it gets publicized in the paper, the Democrats go ballistic. Now, everybody who studies American history at all knows that when Theodore Roosevelt invited a black man. Booker T. Washington to the White House to dine, there was a huge explosion. Well, that was uh, foretold by all kinds of similar explosions that took place every time Lincoln interacted with a black person. And then it got reported in the newspapers. So the, the Democrats would say, oh, now he's promotion, promoting miscegenation. Now he's promoting racial equality. And this is just appalling. Um, and Lincoln just, just shrugged it off. Uh, right, right. And uh, so. Who are some of the... Uh, uh, you want to talk a little bit about the, the Frederick Douglass meetings? Oh, absolutely. Those are, among sure. the, those are among the most compelling, and they do sort of set up our understanding of those two speeches we began with. So why don't you right. summarize those three meetings? The uh, well, sure. Uh, uh, I feel a little sheepish doing that. <laughs> Well, it's all right. You've been by the man who's written the <laughs> definitive book on the subject. But <laughs> all right. Um, but anyway, so so Frederick Douglass comes to the White House the first time in August of '63, not in the, at the invitation of Lincoln, but um, uh, because he wants to go there, and and because he has a senator uh, leading him and um, escorting him, uh, uh, Senator Palmer of Kansas. Uh, and so, so Lincoln then um, thanks to the president for issuing an order of retaliation. Uh, that this has been a sore subject in, uh, among black people uh, in general and, Link, uh, and Douglas in particular, that is that, that, um, uh, that black prisoners of war were being badly mistreated, if not actually, I mean, really murdered in cold blood uh, 
by Confederates, um, and that something had to be done to stop that. Uh, and so Lincoln did issue an order uh, of retaliation at the end of July, and Douglas so thanks him in, the, in mid August. Um, uh, and Lincoln then explains that was pretty hard to enforce, actually. But and then then Douglas says, "No, uh, I, about the, the differential pay, uh, the black soldiers are getting paid less than white soldiers." And Lincoln said, "Well, it's an unfortunate. I, I disapprove of that. But in order to get that legislation through Congress, we had to make this concession. But we'll take care of it. And for the most part, not entirely, not a hundred percent, but but it was retroactively." Uh, 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 paid the, the soldiers, black soldiers who had uh, been shortchanged. Um, uh, and then An indication, um, it's one of the many indications of Lincoln's sensitivity to public opinion, right? He says, exactly. you know, right. have, we, we just have only recently have this experience of black troops at, at, at these various battles who have proven themselves worthy and it's having a salutary effect on Northern public opinion. So he says something like, you know, public opinion had to be brought up to the to this point where they would accept equal pay for black soldiers. And, right. and you know, it's an, it's an interesting aspect of Lincoln's approach to this whole issue that he's, he's willing to push public sentiment, but he's also aware of the limitations that public sentiment uh, uh, places on him. Okay. Right. And that, that, and he says that, that, that to Douglas. Yeah. Right. And it's in keeping with his his uh, favorite play when Hamlet says ripeness is all. You, know, you, you, you timing really counts, and and the fact that the black soldiers have distinguished themselves at Milliken's Bend and Port Hudson and uh, right. Battery Wagner, um, and not just about Battery Wagner, it was just the preceding month. So uh, that, that's that started that's having a profound effect on public opinion, which indeed it did. And he but, and he and he starts pushing right after that. He starts right. actually taking an active role in pushing public opinion in the Conkling letter and the, right. the other various public letters. Right. So what about the second meeting? Oh, well, the second later? meeting is, is, is even more interesting because yeah. Lincoln summons Frederick Douglass. Uh, if Douglass doesn't come escorted by a, a, a senator, Lincoln says, I, I want to talk to you about, about something. And that is, I think I'm going to lose my reelection bid. Uh, and as of March 4th, 1865, there's going to be a Democrat in the White House. And he is going to end, uh, we don't know who it is, uh, yet, uh, and he's going to end the war, and all the slaves who have made it to our lines are going to be free, and all the slaves who haven't made it to our lines are going to remain in slavery. So let's do everything we can to let the black people know that, that, that the clock is running and that they should get to Union lines as quickly as they can. So I'd like you, I'd like you to organize an, uh, an outfit of, of spies, in, in effect, of scouts to go into the behind uh, the Confederate lines and, and tell the black people, Come flee to Union lines. Get get your freedom. This is this, this is a matter of extreme importance, uh, and this is very much like John Brown's initial idea that you, you, you go out and you encourage the blacks to run away um, as a kind of prelude to an uprising in the in Brown's case, um, and so so uh, and and so Frederick Douglass is is flattered and and he goes off and and he does, drafts a plan um, to uh, carry out this vision. Uh, but then uh, Lincoln's re-election seems assured uh, in the time between the meeting in the White House and the time that Frederick Douglass has the plan and submits it to the president, uh, Union uh, victories at, uh, at Atlanta and in the Shenandoah Valley and Mobile Bay at all guaranteed Lincoln's re-election. So it was not really necessary to do that. But it's extraordinary that Lincoln would invite Douglass to, to and, and give him this, this important charge. And it, and it changes the way Douglas thinks about Lincoln in significant ways, right? He, he, it, it leads Douglas to realize that uh, Lincoln was far more committed to uh, the abolition of slavery than he had realized, right? And that I think is the setup for that eulogy. Don't you think he had come away, he went to Absolutely. visit Lincoln, uh, he went to visit Lincoln one more time at the inaugural uh, ball and right. you know, famously, He's not allowed in by the guards, and Lincoln finds out about it and insists that he be he be brought in, and and, and clearly right. in front of everyone, hundreds of people, announces his friendship to Douglas, and that's the context in which I think we have to understand that eulogy later that year, right? Don't you think? Right. He, yes, he and, has, that, and that brings us full circle as as our hour <laughs> winds down. Um, that the larger point is is of my book is is 
that um, in addition to Frederick Douglass, now, the Frederick Douglass's statements about Lincoln being cordial and uh, open and respectful and all that are, are fairly well known. The fact is there are lots of black people who said that. And those black people's voices have not really been heard or they haven't all been gathered in one spot, which is what I tried to do. Uh, you do very and, well. Well, very, very, very well. well. Thank you. Thank you. And so the larger point is that Lincoln's essential instinctive racial egalitarianism is illustrated um, vividly in the way he interacted with black people, um, with, the, with the exception of that meeting on August 14th. But then that was that was given the political situation at the time, uh, almost necessary to be uh, uh, as you say, prepared. as you say, even in that meeting, he made some of his most most damning remarks about slavery and his most damning remarks about white racism. So right. I think I think I think uh, your book does all of this very be beautifully and it's an important book and I, I, I'm glad we've had this chance to talk about it and, and bring it to a wider public. Thank you. Very Jim, much. thank you so much for those kind words and thank you for participating in this and, and sure. uh, it's been my very distinct pleasure. Mine as well. Thank you.